Thanks very much and welcome today. Um, welcome my friend Jesse who worked with me on this project many, many, many years ago living in Gainda. Um, <clears throat> look, so I want to, I don't know how much any of you know about communal groups and communalism, so I'm, I'm going to go through a little bit of the background, what we mean by these groups, a little bit of the, the global history, very, very brief and quick, then look at the Australian, the Queensland history, and then focus on those in this area in the 1890s, and then the last bit, look at some of the contemporary groups, because some people mistakenly think that this was a historical phenomenon, while there's more people today living in these communal groups than probably ever in the past. Uh, but so I'll take you through quite a bit <clears throat> and have some time at the end for sort of discussion or whatever. If I say something you don't quite understand what it is, yell out, there's no point sitting there. But <laughs> if it's any big general discussion on the ethics of communalism versus, like, let's keep that to the end, okay? So what do we mean by, I'll, I'll just quickly go, there is a formal definition. The, the informal definition basically is a group of people unrelated by blood, who live together as a pseudo family or like a family, where you share. That's the, but but we, I'll take you through the formal definition five or more people from more than one family or kinship group who voluntarily come together. So we wouldn't consider a group of prisoners to be living communally, if they are, but they're not in community. Uh, why do they do it to ameliorate some social problem or inadequacy? Um, they seek to live beyond the bounds of mainstream society by a consciously devised way to live. So they believe that we should all look after all the children or we should share or whatever they believe, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and they share significant aspects of their lives, almost always property, almost always money, sometimes sexuality, um, sometimes they're very, very intimate, sometimes not so intimate, it depends. Uh, we call it a we consciousness. A we consciousness means so if, if I'm part of Jesse's family, we don't just think of me and Jesse, we think we. There's a kind like we are, we have something, as people do. So think of it like a family in many ways, because that's what it is. You, know, you and your family have some concept of the we. And they see themselves as continuing separate from, and generally think of themselves as better than the rest of society. Um, a couple of myths, one is it's a recent phenomenon, the number of, I get annoyed the number of times people say, oh, you mean groups from the hippies of the 1960s. And I say, well, that's, uh, the first that we know about was 525 BC Pythagoras. You all heard of Pythagoras' theorem when you were doing mathematics. It was a communal group in, in what's now Italy. Of course, there was no Italy. Uh, again, they shared everything. There was no private, as far as we know. The, the records aren't terribly good. It lasted about 60 years, something like that. Um, they've only, only lasted a short time. People say that to me, oh, they just collapse overnight. Well, the oldest one in the world, still operating continuously, is in the States, started in 1794, uh, Sabbath Day Lake Shaker community. That's one of the buildings. They're, they're, they were about 100 people. They're now down to about 20, 25 people living there. Uh, again, they share everything. That's the oldest one in the world. That's not a good photograph, but that's one of the meeting halls. One of their rules is that men and women are always separate. They're completely celibate. So men sit on one side and women on the other. Uh, doesn't mean women are less important than men, quite the opposite, but that's one of their many rules. Uh, Australia's oldest communal group or intentional community is the Manor in Sydney, <coughs> right on Sydney Harbour. Uh, they started 1922, so they're coming up to their centennial. Uh, I've spent time there, written about them quite a bit. That's a picture from the harbor front of their home in 1923 or something. No, he, yeah, he was the leader, very, very strange man. I won't go into him too much, but he's very, very peculiar and very strange sexual things, but anyway. Uh, they gained, they believed in sharing everything. Uh, they lived together in, th in this house. They were a very, very well-to-do group of people. They, uh, most, many of them had professional jobs, but all the money went into the community. So if you're a nurse, your nurse's salary goes straight into the to the treasurer, and then the treasurer's paying, looking after everything. That's a picture of their, their house now, they're still there. Uh, there's only about eight or 10, it would be worth some millions of dollars because it's right on the harbor. But, Mossman, Mossman, Mossman. But it would be worth, except that it's, it's um, the Sydney Harbor Conservation Trust or something like that, this is all under their control. So if you bought it, you couldn't knock it down. Uh, and who in the world needs a house like that to maintain? 
Uh, but anyway, that's, and, uh, that's just a picture from some years ago when they were a bit larger. That's their dining room, just to give you an idea. So about 40, 45 people can sit and eat at one time. Uh, that's one of the elderly members. The average age of the members now would be at least my age in the 70s. So whether they'll continue to live, we don't, we don't know. The first one in Australia, the first intentional community in Australia, uh, was uh, called Herrenhut in Western Victoria. Uh, they were a group of uh, Germans that came over here and they believed they were escaping persecution and they were going to live the perfect life in Australia. He was their leader and that's not, that's not a fake, that's an ordinary chair. He was very, very small. He was four foot something, the leader, Johann Krum now. Absolutely brilliant man, absolutely brilliant, totally obsessed. He believed that, that he was the spokesman for God, that God had spoken through him. He spoke apparently very hard. He had a, a cleft palate. And spoke, but people that heard him said he was just magnificent the way he would hold your attention. He started this, this group. There were 73, 74 people there, um, mostly Germans. Uh, the first generation all spoke German. Uh, and then they started speaking English, which was part of the problem because that made it easy for the younger people to move on. Um, that's just one a painting of the early days, and you can see how they, they dressed the children in these little little frills, like like little little European uh, medieval almost children. Um, again, the children were the responsibility of everybody. So if you had a child, you're not responsible for that. Well, you're responsible for all the children. No more your child than somebody else's. So the children were looked after. The men all worked together. There was no private property. Uh, everything that they sold, the women of the community ran quite a, a good little dairy industry selling. Uh, and one of the problems we found out from the uh, correspondence was that there was, a, there was competition for the use of the horses because the horses were spending a lot of the time going between the commune and Ararat. Ararat was the gold fields at the time, selling the dairy products. And they, were, they claimed, and I think this is an exaggeration, they claimed they were getting a pound, for, pound of gold, a pound's worth of money for a pound of butter. There was such a shortage of dairy food. So the women were doing very, very well with that, but the trouble was then the horses were no good for doing farm work because by the time they'd go up there for two days and back for two days, they'd have to have a few days layover, so there was issue around that. Um, that was just at the end of the commune period. Uh, they lived in these large, large buildings. Um, this building uh, was supposedly the single women's building. I'm not quite sure. This was the, where they ate. The, we know this because of later pictures. Um, that, by then, the, their leader, that was where he lived and also where they had the schoolroom in there. This was about 1925, about when they were collapsing. Um, well. They collapsed as a commune in 1890-something, but they still live there. Um, and this is what it looks like now. So you can see what's, what's left still of the stone remains and everything. Um, <clears throat> interesting. Yes, sir. Do you know why they chose that area to go to? It was, uh, it was opening up. They were breaking up uh, a large um, grazing run, and uh, they were able to get uh, about 1,500 acres of land. Um, and the state government, at the, well, the colonial government at the time was quite supportive of getting anybody on there. And these people came in. Now, so interesting, um, I showed you Krum now before. He died 1882. And to show you how radical this community was for the time, they had two really weird, weird notions. One was that indigenous people are as good as European people. And that really outraged a lot of the people in the area. And so they were open for, and there was very, a lot of persecution in that area, in the western area around um, uh, Hamilton. And so they were always, the Aborigines were always welcome to come on the land here. And it nearly bankrupted them at one point. They had 300 people staying there. And that's an awful lot of people to feed. And they ended up killing some of their, their breeding ewes because they couldn't have enough food. But anyway, that was one of their weir weird views, seen as weird at the time. The other weird view was that women and men are equal. And so when Krum now died in 1882, she took over as leader, Louise Elmore. That's just her husband who put him in the photograph. Uh, she took over as, as the leader. And this was, again, completely unheard of that a woman would be in charge. Of. Now, she had gr grown up on the property. She'd lived there all of her life. She wasn't able to keep it going. That's another whole story. But I've written, that's what's left now. I was recently there 
some of the buildings are still there. They're heritage listed, of course. Uh, wrote a book about that. Um, Elizabeth Hoof, who worked with me on that, she's a vague descendant of it. So there's lots of memories of that in the area. Uh, recently, La Trobe University did an archaeological dig on the site. And one of the things that they found, because I, when I went to visit the site during it there, the archaeologist said, we can't work it out. We're, they're finding bits of money and everything. He said, we're finding all these, these Chinese coins. Where would they come from? I said, well, I know perfectly well where they're coming from. They're coming from the gold fields at Ararat. Because these people were very happy to deal with the Chinese or the Aborigines or anybody, whereas some of the Europeans wouldn't. So uh, it was interesting. To, and that was one of the wells that they had excavated on the site. So it's quite a bit of, uh, and I'll talk about the archaeological ruins when we get to the gained ones in a minute. Um, that's one of the graves, still some graves there of people and everything like that. It was, it was said, there's a myth that when they buried Crum now, some people were so upset with him. He, he was said to be such a horrible man by some people, they buried him face down so that if he was resurrected, he'd, he'd go straight to hell kind of thing. <laughs> that's simply wrong. One of the things we found was that the, the ordinary people living close to the commune thought he was great, the people were great. People living further away thought there was all these rumors that they, you know, women were taken advantage and all, and it's all rubbish. It depend, if you knew nothing about them, you had these myths about these horrible people. Uh, the people that were close, they were great people. Anyway, that's first in Queensland is uh, Friends Farm on the Sunshine Coast near uh, Caloundra, 1868, a group of uh, Quakers. And just, uh, so that's the end of Caloundra there. Just, there's a big dam in there. So the, the Bruce Highway is about, about here now, the Malula River, and that was their land all through here. That's where they had their own sugar mill in the 1860s, the first sugar mill in that part of Queensland. They started the whole sugar industry. Um, this is a picture from 1957, before it had been cleared. So you can still see remains of there the sugar can crushers, crushing uh, mills. Uh, he was, I forget his name now, but he managed to collect that, so we still have that equipment. Um, that's a picture of the same spot now. It's, it's uh, just part of the um, reserve for the, the water supply, uh, so it's overgrown, very hard to find things there. He was the founder of it, uh, Alfred Allen, uh, Quaker from Sydney, very radical Quakers. Uh, again, they believed in complete equality. They were opposed to capitalism. They believed we needed to all work together. Again, they were quite opposed to, even though most of them did marry, they didn't really believe in marriage. They believed that, that sexuality should be open so that we should love each other, that the children should be the responsibility of everybody. They were opposed, to, this group were opposed to the idea that like, you have your little family and I have my little family and I compete with you for resources that we all have to share together. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it wasn't real ha uh, popular with some of the critics. Uh, Alfred Branscombe, he was kind of the intellect of the, the group. Um, Reby, he was uh, very, very co committed. They're all German. Uh, Joseph Dixon. Now, some of you, if you, you know um, uh, that area, you might tell there was Dixon's Mill uh, in, um, in that area. Um, that's the remains today in the museum in uh, Nambour. Uh, there's a little plaque there about it, but that's all stuff from the manure. They, 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 they gave one of the, f the most incredible accounts of the first in co um, contact with indigenous people. And one of them, I think it was Reby, I can't remember, Dixon. Can't, well, one of them kept a diary. And he described they were ca camping on this land, because they loved this land on the, right on the Malula River, because it was cleared of vegetation, so that must be God's will. Well, it wasn't cleared because of God. It was cleared because it's a floodplain. And it was ready for the plow. And of course, on a floodplain, it's beautiful soil. And so they were camped there. And the, these Aborigines came through, and they described them in great detail. And it's just a brilliant account. So the, the local uh, Aboriginal council sort of were delighted when I discovered this account, because one of those first ones when the guy's actually sitting there talking about these people. Never occurred to these men that, that they were occupying Aboriginal land. Uh, they had a right to it, and they just settled on it. And they got on reasonably well with the Aborigines because they didn't go chasing their animals or anything like that. But they were on a floodplain, and they flooded nearly every year. And by 1873, I think it was, they, they finally gave up, moved into what's now Butterham. So Butterham 
came out of that group and established the, uh, the, the, the cane mill in Butterham and started growing weird things like, um, um, what's the Butterham famous for? The gin ginger, ginger and things like that. So, so Butterham is there because of this commune largely. Um, now the Queen, that's mainly talking about Queensland cooperative communities. So in 1893, Queensland was in a financial crisis and under um, Samuel Griffith, who was a very, very liberal in the true sense of the word, not the Australian political sense for true liberal, was very interested. He was, uh, I wouldn't say a close friend, but he was friends with William Lane, who led the group to Paraguay sort of thing. And so he was, Griffith was genuinely concerned if this would be an answer for poverty, if this would be a way of getting impoverished workers out of the city and getting people onto the land, they could look after themselves. There was also a fear of, of riots, etc., of people starving in the cities. So particularly Brisbane. Brisbane had the terrible flood in 1893, as you did. We've got to do something. And so it was this idea that we can put these people on the land and they can grow their own food, they can look after themselves and become a source. So they established 12 of them around. The three that we're interested in today is Bon Accord, Burnstown, and uh, Resolute. Uh, they were near, uh, near Gainda. So there were three near Chinchilla, three near Roma, three at Gainda, or between here and Gainda, uh, one at Rolston uh, near Springshire, uh, one at Pomona. In fact, Pomona is there because of Protestant unity. I mean, the, the, the train station of Pomona was the siding for the Protestant unity commune. So it's a, the other was at, uh, at uh, Noosa. Uh, that was called the Woolongaba Exemplars. So they had, they had lovely names like uh, Mon Nil Desperand, I mean, I'm not desperate. So anyway, we'll talk briefly about the three that were in this area. And to give you a, an idea where they are, so that's the town of Gainda. This is the Burnett Highway, comes along here. Like, if, you'll all remember there's a really sharp corner there, and this goes down to Ban Ban Springs. So there used to be a school right there. That was part of Bon Accord Commune, ran right along there to Bramba Creek. Resolute Commune started from here and went up here to Garulba on the rail line was where uh, they lived originally and then they started moving down on the creek here. And this was the Burnstown Commune in here. And the Burnstown on the rail line, of course, is named after them. Uh, but the commune wasn't, they li didn't live there, they lived closer down about here. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So, uh, and the rail line, of course, this is a rail line running through um, across, across here. Um, so clo close to Gainda, and you can still, when you, when you drive along, along this road, you get to, let's see, hang on, where is it? You get to here, and the sign is for Bon Accord Bridge. That's, Bon Accord is where the Bon Accord Commune was. Um, you go up here, you've got the town of uh, Burnstown up here, you've got the little cemetery, I was speaking to somebody before, still the Burnstown cemetery, Commune Cemetery there. Uh, when the railway was coming through, they didn't want to, they named this after the Commune, they named the bridge, they didn't like to name it after the Resolute, so they called it Garulba, which was the name of the local parish, so the name of Garulba's pretty well disappeared. About 500 people moved in there within two or three weeks. So the, the population dub of Europeans doubled over a two week period, amazing input. Uh, to give you a bit, so the cemetery that's there today, so this is Burnstown Commune. So this is the, the, the current road coming up, goes along, along like that, a reserve here. Uh, this Weathering Creek, and so they had their sheep yards here and they lived in little huts right along Weathering Creek, along here. This was where they had their school, I was mentioning somebody can still see the site of the school because they, they used uh, ant nest to beat it down and so there's not much grows on that site. And you just go up the road here. It's, it's well worth going to, it's a brilliant cemetery. There's photographs of that in the, in the book that I have. Um, and they farmed all of this area. Quite good area. The, the big problem, part of the problem was 1893 was the wettest year in Queensland's history. 1894 was about the third or fourth wettest year. So when they moved up there, they went up the end of it, 1993, they talked about weather and creek was big enough you could float a ship on it. Well, Jesse and I know weather and creek. I've, I think you could die looking for a cup of water in weather and creek. But, <laughs> but, and they also said the grass was so tall you'd lose a bullock in the grass. You know, 
Well, yes, it was in 1893 and 94. You could drop a bean and it would grow. It was fantastic. But of course, that didn't, didn't last very long. Um, so that was the site. So they had their own school and everything. And there's photographs of the, the school there. Uh, now, Burnstown was predominantly Roman Catholic. There was one Protestant man living there. He was married to one of the Catholic women. And uh, Resolute Commune was, was almost exclusively Protestant. They were side by side and shared the same school. So there were certain grounds for uh, problems there. Harry Hid is one of my great favorites. You go out along the road, there's a plaque in his favor. He was an absolutely brilliant man. He was the leader of Resolute. Um, I looked and I looked because you're always interested as a historian, is this person really as lily white as he seems to be? He must have had some. He was, he was a wonderful man. He, he truly was. Totally committed to the, to the communal venture. Totally committed. He never interfered with the women or anything like that. He died of TB, I think it was, in the 1930s. But a brilliant man. That's the only photograph we have of him. Um, that was the school for Burnstown Resolute. A bark hut, and that was where the, the, the teacher was expected to sleep in, in that thing. Uh, well, they, they had a teacher. That's another picture of the school, and that's the teacher. The first teacher was a, a male, and then the second teacher was a female that came. And, um, but they, they, that was their only school. Then they built two other schools over time, and of course, there's no school there anymore. Um, and they, they gained the Protestant and Catholic children educated together, and that was. Um, unusual for that time. There tend to be more segregation, but they weren't. In fact. Now, this is an interesting photo. This is the Lowe family on Resolute Commune. Uh, there was a photographer, and we have the date he went through, taking photographs of school. So he would come to your house and take a photograph of your family, then come back, try and get you to buy a copy of it. And so you can see what they've done here. They've <clears throat> now, having a saddle horse was a luxury, absolute luxury. And that tells us something important. The families all dressed up. You can see the kids have their best on. That's dad there and that's mom there. The rules were of all these communes, there's no private property. So if you go off cutting cane for a month or something like that, your income goes straight to the treasurer. Well, some of the men, including Mr. Lowe, cheated on that. So they'd come back with some of the money and a horse, their own horse. And the communes never really enforced that rule, because really that horse should have belonged to the community. But in fact, he's got that as his own horse, because that would be a source of independence. He could go off to town. He'd be, And that was one of the key problems of these communes. But that's, that's the latter phase. The first year or so, they lived just under canvas. But you can see there, they've, uh, now there's nothing, of course, left of that building. We know where it was, but there's nothing left. They didn't have windows, just boards. But still, that horse is a very political, important political statement, a riding horse. No, no use at all for farming, a horse like that. Uh, it's a luxury that he kept to himself. Um, Merton family, there's still lots of Mertons there. And again, you see a riding horse. Same sort of thing. Mertons are still a, an important family in the area. They were great help to me, as were the Lowe family, uh, still living in the area. But you can see also, Oh, no it's, not, no, it's not a window, is it? It still just slides in the door. But that looks to me like a, a shingle roof. Marker. So again, this was part of the problem, that, that although everybody was saying, yes, we agree that we will all share, but I may not quite want to share as much as I want you to share with me. And so there was an issue right from the start. They broke up in 1896. Uh, the state government, the colonial government, just basically decided to cancel the, the leases and basically just told them, you don't have the land anymore. They were allowed, the people who were living there were allowed to put in a claim for part of the land as a private settler. And these families did, did that. Some families did. There's no woman in that photograph. No, she died. She died. She was dead. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's very good. I meant to point. Yeah, he, he, was, he was the only, I think, the only male head of family without a woman in, in Resolute. Uh, he ended up marrying the new school teacher that I came. Was ask. Yeah, no, he did. He linked up with the new and, and quite a, quite a decent man. But again, he was cheating. This is the uh, Bon Accord <coughs> group. So uh, I need to get my client. So that's that was the 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 old coach road between Maryborough and Gainda, down through here. It didn't cross the Burnett Creek, but it crossed the Baramba Creek, and that's now where the Bon Accord Bridge is held. And you can see there the huts, again, they spread along here. 
the store was where they kept all their, all their food and supplies and everything like that. They had a school reserve up here, although they didn't build a school there. They built the school over there for some obscure reason. I don't quite know. Um, and that was some of their land. They're very good, quite good soil. It's, it's, it's good farmland. They, they were, did fairly well on that. Were these guys from Britain or? Yeah. Uh, some of them said they had agricultural experience. Almost none of them did. Uh, two or three of them had some rural experience in Australia. That was on large properties. Nobody had any agricultural experience pertaining to Australia. Now, uh, there's another whole story about that. The Queensland government appointed somebody called Professor Shelton. He wasn't a professor, but they called him that, an American, to be an agricultural advisor. He was the first agricultural advisor in Australia, appointed by the Queensland government. And one of his jobs was to go around and advise these groups. But at the same time, in doing this research, I found some confidential instructions sent to him, instructing him to do as little as he could to help these groups because certain people in the lands department did not want these groups to survive. So while he was hired to do this, and he wanted to do it, because he had lived in a commune in America himself in the 1870s, his instructions were to do as little as possible. So there's a real tension. So they didn't know much about agriculture, no. Um, it was, it was, I mean, it was a really corrupt system, and it was a real breakthrough in your research. You know, when you, when you discover this document thing, bloody hell. <laughs> uh, there it is, it's written out, you know, confidential, strictly confidential, but that's instructions to him to do as little. So we said, well, we've hired you to do this, but you're going to be in trouble if you actually do that. Um, that was the Bonacord School, uh, not a terribly good photo, but we don't have uh, slightly the comment of it. Now, <clears throat> I just want to show you a couple of families. The Hanlon family, uh, that was young Edward Hanlon. Does that ring a bell for anybody? Ned Hanlon, Ed, Ed, Edwin, come on. Ned Hanlon, he was Queensland Premier for <laughs> this young man. He went on to become Queensland Premier in the 1950s into the 60s. And uh, very, very uh, reformist. He, was, he, he introduced the, uh, what's it called, the mother and child, the mother and child, the uh, maternity. What? Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. So he was very, very concerned about, because they grew up in poverty. This is the, the they, I don't know where they had this photograph taken. Uh, all phot photographic studios then would have, so this would be a little suit that would just hang up the back. They'd put it on him, it wouldn't be his suit. They'd, the little boys dressed up the same. There's no way that family had that. Yeah, I mean. Is that one or two families? Sorry? Is that one or two families? No, no, one. He was the oldest son the oldest oh, son. No, no, quite a big family. But he's, he's the one that, that went on to become Premier. Now I'm going to show you next one, and don't tell me you don't know anybody in this photograph. The Whartons. Anybody remember the Wharton family from Gainda? Claude, Claude Wharton. He was minister for damn near everything under Bielke Peterson at one point. Uh, that's his grandparents. And I interviewed Claude several times as part of this, and he just couldn't quite believe that his grandmother, had been a committed suffragette and communist and various things. And Claude was a, a Jesse knows him, Claude's a cranky old bugger. I was just going to say, his grandson, Claude, became a Queensland. That's right, that's right. He, he was a minister, yeah. But so, I, I mean, some of the families ended up, well, they're still around. There's lots of people I was discovering. That was Jesse and other people from the store side were helping me track down families. Um, that was the book that came out of it. Um, I'd like to say it's for sale, but it's not. It's been out of print for 15, 20 years, but there's copies here in the library. It's worth, worth reading. It's about that, uh, about those communes. Um, well, we can't really stop him from seeking an alternative <laughs> lifestyle. Now, I like this one. Here's a, oh, hang on. Here's the, oh, wait a minute. What do we do? No, hang on. What do I do? Yeah. Here's the, the, the classic hippie, hippie couple. And here's the little sun going off. So one of the key problems that these groups I'm just showing you found, all of them found, is the second generation because they've grown up that way, they often want something else. And, yeah, and going back to Hernhut, a big problem there was that, well, I, I didn't go, the husband, the man who became the husband of, of uh, Louisa Elmore, 
He came there, he was English, he came there as an English teacher. And in that one sense, that's the biggest mistake they ever made. Another sense, it was very generous, because that meant that all of that second generation were fluent in English. That meant it was very easy for them just to move off, and so some of them ended up going to, uh, overseas in the Boer War, and some of them were killed in the First World War, because they could speak English. And this is a problem with all of these groups, is that the, the first generation are totally committed to whatever it is. The second generation say, oh, why would I do that? I want a, I want a nice car, I want my own something or other. Um, so we have a book, one of the books, it should, I think it's in the library, so I'm not sure. I think it's, hopefully it's in the library, uh, looking at that whole mo more modern movement in Australia. Uh, now I'm just going to talk about two or three contemporary uh, intentional communities to give you an idea. One of the ones you might have heard is Crystal Waters, it's, it's near Mullaney. Uh, it's about 30 years old now. I'll just show you a couple of pictures of it. Crystal Waters, obviously we have to have a creek with crystal water in it. That's just a recent photograph of the members. Now, you might notice that they're not exactly children. Uh, I look through there, and I guess the average age would be 60, something like that, with a, a few older people. There's a few little children. And most of the communities are like that. The age is, is not young people. The age is middle-aged, right across the uh, That's just one of the, they, they don't normally eat together, but they have kamala meals. And just to give you an idea of the housing, if you think they all live in sort of uh, shacks or something, um, this one happens to be for sale, so I got some nice photographs of it. Uh, not exactly poor, uh, and there's no reason they should be poor, but very, very nice places. Um, some are rural and some are urban, so I'm going to show you a few pictures of an urban intentional community. This one happens to be from Tasmania, uh, just because I have to have some good photos of it. But, but the, the movement, this whole movement is becoming much more ur urban all the time. It used to be very rural. But for example, I gave you the pictures of um, the manor in Sydney. Now that's very urban. That's the oldest one in Australia, still, still operating. It's 98 years old. Cascade, so that's just a picture from the air. That's their community center. They eat together there and they have houses. Now, in some cases, uh, so each person has a little area with a kitchenette, so you can make a cup of tea or something, but you can't really cook there. The cooking is all done in the common area there. Uh, and some people live alone, and some of those will have like three or four people living in it or whatever. Some of those are big enough, they'll have like an upper and a lower. Um, very nicely designed houses, uh, cars are, you can have your own car, but they also have cars that are shared. So five of us might have a car, so I go online and I say I'd like the car tomorrow, and if I'm Jesse's already got it booked, well, that's tough, I've got to... Then I would check with Jesse, where are you going tomorrow? She said, I'm going to da-da-da, and I said, well, can I get a lit or whatever. Um, very, very lovely, little, lovely houses. That's, uh, no, that, that's just in the kitchen of the common house. I was helping him prepare a meal. That's how they do it, so each person the name is down here, there are the dates. <clears throat> so you tick whether you're going to be there for dinner or not that day, and it rotates. So normally you would cook one day a month. And you might have 15 people, you might have 30 people to cook for. Um, that's just inside the dining lounge area kind of thing. Very, very comfortable, very comfortable. Uh, it costs many millions of dollars to build that, but it's cheap per person. When you have 30 or so people pooling the money, it becomes quite cheap for each individual. And it's very, very nice to accommodate. The other thing they have there is that there's a guest wing that has two bedrooms and a, and a shared bathroom, I think. That's for visitors. So if, Jessie, if Jessie's living there and I want to come and visit, she doesn't have to have a spare room. She just books that room for me and I've got it. But then, so obviously at certain times it's quite busy, so you need to book early, but it, so it makes it very cheap. You don't have to each have spare rooms for your kids to come. Um, the group does. Oh, that's just another picture of them after, after dinner. Uh, now, so it goes from the very, very poor up to the, the top of the spectrum. Crumbin Eco Village is, <clears throat> is the, the luxurious one, uh, one of the most luxurious in the world, the Gold Coast hinterland. Um, it started 1996 and until about 2007. It's, it's still going, but it's, it's multi-million dollars. You'll see houses there for sale for like a million dollars, two million dollars, that sort of thing. 
Uh, but it's still an eco-village. They still share a great deal. They still work together, but it's, it's not for the ordinary. Uh, yeah. And there's no reason it, it should be. Um, that's just a, a, a part of the original plans. They have a, a cafe, bakery, etc., studios. So they, they have workspaces so that I might... Mm, Jesse does photography, so Jesse and three other people might want to have their own studio there. They don't need to have room in the house. You just use part of that space or you might, you and I might want to really be into woodwork. So we grab one of the spaces there and we share the equipment or something like that. So again, it's about sharing things. Uh, <clears throat> beautiful architecture, that's a little bridge they, they put in. Now it would have been much, much, much cheaper just to whack in a bit of a metal bridge across there, but they built a lot of stones. Uh, well, it gives you an idea of some of the, some of the housing. It's very, very uh, ritzy. Um, <clears throat> Some of the interiors are rather, again, this was online, I got these. Uh, they have a very large common area where they will have parties. The last time I stayed there was at a friend of mine who lives there, it was his 65th birthday. So they have their own area, they'll have dances, they have all sorts of functions there, a large yeah, kitchen, yeah. so there must have been about 100 of us there for, for his birthday. Uh, oh, that's a terrible photograph, just one of the dances they're doing. Uh, yeah, they, they have regular working bees. I don't know what they're doing. They're planting something there. I can't remember what it was now. But they're just all members, just you know, helping. Um, it's very luxurious. That's the picture. I like that one. That's out of a real estate ad, too. It looks nice. Um, this was an alternative lifestyle when we began. So I put that in just because a lot of people would sort of say, looking at that, well, this is not quite what we understood by an intentional community. <laughs> That's because we think these people need to be poor and, you know, just eating a few lentils and growing some onions in the garden. And some are still. But the movement's changed. The world has changed. And why should they be in poverty? Um, one of the things we find about this, communal economics is a very powerful notion. It's where you five people could pool your limited resources, you each have limited resources, but between you, you'd have an amazing amount of resources. Now, if you can find a way to live with that, to create a structure where you can share that, giving each of you the privacy you want, but the communalism you want. So, you, for example, you have, you'd have one washing machine between the five of you. You'd have one refrigerator, maybe, one, maybe two cars. You know, so it might mean that, that if you have two cars between the five of you, one small and one big, it means each of you have a choice when you want to go out, do I take the big car? So the communal economics is a very powerful notion, and these groups actually live quite cheaply, relatively cheaply, because they share everything. Uh, one group, I didn't show my pictures today in, in uh, Melbourne, an urban group, about 40, 45 people living there. They have two washing machines but they're proper industrial washing machines. I mean, big ones that you would have in a laundromat. So like they can run for years all the time coming. And so it's, and the system works there that if, if you want to wash your clothes, you just go down and put it in if the machine's available. If you know that you need to do a quick wash after work on Friday, you just put a sign saying this is booked from Friday from five to six. So if I come in at five to five, I say, well, I can't use it. Um, but it's a fantastic system. Um, and in that community, one person uh, is paid by the other members for one or two days a week as a general handy person. So if your door's jamming and you need something, well, you just leave a note. I forget just how it is. So they're very, very good efficiently. Sorry. Well, who organizes it, though? So, do they have committees? To yes, yes, always meetings and always eating together. Eating together is one of the key determinants of success, as it is with a family. You know, if you don't eat together with your children or grandchildren, or everything, it's not, or your partner, it ain't going to work. And it's a key determinant with these groups, that if a group stop eating together, it's, it's in trouble. Um, that's it. Um, I'm going to open to questions or discussion or whatever. Leaving at that point, thoughts?